Got it. We can try it again. That, ah, that was good. Hello. 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 Hello, everyone. Hello. 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 Yeah, hello. It's a good thing. We feel the energy now. Yeah. It's not like a quiet room here. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, usually the dialogue starts from hello. Exactly. <laughs> a great one. Actually, uh, it's good. We can do it one more time. But first, please say hello to yourself. I know it, it feels a little funny, but it's good. You can say hello to yourself in different kinds of ways, like... <laughs> Please try to say hello to yourself first. You can open your camera and just say hello to yourself first. Very good. And then let's try one more time with the sound because now we're on the YouTube. <laughs> it's okay if people make the sound at the same time. That will happen just organically because of the, what's that called? The timing of life. <laughs> mm. So just when you feel the, the instinct, the intuition to say hello, <laughs> turn on your microphone and just say hello. 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 That's beautiful. Okay. So if I can start by just saying uh Tumakasi Sakali. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much. You're welcome, Mbak Dian. And before the presentation, I will uh, show you a documentation of Mbak Dian performance. It's entitled Dewa Ruci Nyapu for Open Day at Mandala Wisata Samuan Tiga in Bedulu, Bali uh, in 2019. Uh, the video is by uh, Alexander Jeep. So, please. Who is from Lampung? <laughs> oh, okay. And I'll the share. music was a combination of Penny Chandra from Solo and Meredith Monk, even though they didn't meet each other yet live. Someday, hopefully, they will. Thank you.
terima kasih. Terima kasih, Adi. Ya, and now I will give space and time to Mbak Dian. Okay. <laughs> Dian, please. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. I really thank you to uh, the Center for Religious and Cross-Cultural Studies at Universitas Gajamada and the Indonesian Consortium Religious Studies, both of which I have great respect and awareness of probably since about the beginning of my first encounter with Indonesia in real time and space in 1997 and uh, since then. So it's a great honor to be able to join in this way. And uh, also, as I told Dr. Dickie Sofian, it's very interesting for me to speak English with so many Indonesians. So pardon me if suddenly I say Indonesian words that blip into the middle of the Kalimat. <laughs> so I'm very, very happy. Uh, Abdi and also I can see Ripka there. If it's okay, I'm gonna name a few other names because I feel like uh, having people's presence is very uh, important for dialogue. So it's funny for me to, to speak solo in the beginning. I can see Ida Fitri. <laughs> Uh, let's see, <laughs> Ahmad, Reni, uh, Iqbal, Mursiadi, Jesse Ismoyo, Siamsal Asri, my friend Eva Tarle in Croatia, Nadia, Dominator Time, which is also me, <laughs> uh, Andreas, Jonathan, I think there's others uh, who I can't quite see on the screen yet, pardon any names that I have forgotten to. Francisca, Annie, Mike Quinlan, thank you for joining also, and people who are on the YouTube. So each of us is in a particular place, time and condition for this uh, time together. And uh, it's an interesting phenomena actually to talk about <laughs> intercultural dialogue uh, via Zoom. When in fact, I would say 99% of my experience has been concrete, practical, uh, what researchers would call in the field work. Yesterday, in fact, I had a chat with uh, someone on Facebook Messenger who kept asking me, uh, did I do research? He said, certainly you must do wonderful research from all of your years of experience in Indonesia and in so many other countries, 18 in fact. And I said, oh no, I'm not a researcher. I'm a practitioner who learned how to write and learned how to speak and slowly, slowly learned words that described some of the things that I have learned somehow how to practice with all the small successes and the many, many failures. <laughs> so it was interesting uh, that he asked me that about research because it's not a word that I ever use to describe myself. Um, I usually say that I'm a dancer, a dance movement artist. I'm, I teach, but I used to think of it more as sharing. And yes, I do co-create cultural programs, in fact, quite a lot, <laughs> because it's a great way for artists to be able to come together and to have those kind of dialogues, which I feel are very, very important. But initially I didn't know how very, very important they were until around the year 2000, when I started to realize that large scale institutions like the United Nations and UNESCO were talking about the need for intercultural and interreligious dialogue for peace and harmony in the world. So today I'm actually going to read the paper because I feel somehow that what I wrote is the most indicative of what my uh, 
the thoughts are that I need to share with you today. And I also asked Abdi to please uh, share the PDF version uh, with you. It can be on the chat box, Abdi, or you can put it, uh, you can send it to them via email, either way is fine. Um, that's good, thank you. And please know also that I can't look at the chat box and also say, karena ini rekam on YouTube, because it's a YouTube reckoning, I can only look at this small dot right here for the next hour and a half, which is an interesting phenomenon for somebody who likes to work with spatial things. <laughs> okay. So the judulnya of the paper, the theme of the paper is place, time, and conditions in the art of intercultural dialogue. For those of us working in the field of education and the arts, it is reassuring to see that UNESCO World Report number two, Investing in Cultural Diversity and Intercultural Dialogue, which was published in 2009, includes a section on participatory, participatory learning and intercultural competences, which asserts that in multicultural societies, sensitizing people to cultural diversity is more a matter of approaches, methods, and attitudes. And that the teaching of arts helps to reconnect scientific and emotional processes with intuition, a key component for the cultivation of attitudes favoring intercultural openness. So it's from that view that I would like to share some thoughts from my perspective as a dance movement artist and cultural program director who has had the good fortune to collaborate with artists from varied cultures and faiths in the Americas, Europe, and Asia for over 35 years and since 2001 reside in the villages of Badulu and Tejakula in Bali, Indonesia. Actually, since the mid 1980s, maybe before some of you were born, I have been interested in how the language of art fosters a common field for people of varied cultures, even when their art forms and spoken languages, their mother tongues differ. And how this is also related to what is sometimes called the genius loci or the spirit of a place, the characteristics of an architectural setting. So one of the questions is how can mutual understanding and exchanges among people of different cultures and ethnicities be supported in a manner that recognizes the variety of their worldviews and spatial, temporal, kinesthetic knowledge and cultural and spiritual values. In my experience, a practice-based approach to the art of intercultural dialogue doesn't stem from a predetermined method, but rather is an organic process. And it grows from the interactions of the people involved, which will naturally evolve differently in each place, depending on its historical and cultural and current conditions. One approach that I have greatly appreciated in Indonesia, which has actually given rise to quite good success, is the idea of taking into account the place, time, and conditions. So in Bali, as most of you know, 
who are Indonesian. The term is desa kala patra, while in Javanese, a common term is desa mawa chara, meaning that each village has its own ways. And I would say also each human being is like a little village in that sense and has its own place, time and conditions that are conducive for dialogue. So with this in mind, I'd like to share with you just some ideas that you could consider if you're interested in fostering a common field for dialogue. For me, I'm particularly inspired but by what an old friend of Gajamada University, Solonese movement artist, the late Suprapto Surya, who founded Padepokan Lamaputi, he called it a gardener approach. So what he meant was that the realm of the garden is a source of creativity for the creativity of art. Metaphorically and literally, the garden is a source. And it's an environment in which all the diversity of cultures and in particular, both traditional rural and urban modern peoples with their diverse perceptions, understandings and practices can share and engage in creative dialogue based upon the value of unity and diversity. So cultivating the field of intercultural dialogue in the sense is actually just like the work of a gardener, patani or kabun. It means that you have to have a sensitivity about the qualities of the ground. When is a good time to till the soil, to fertilize it, to water it, and so forth, so that the diverse seeds can blossom in their own place and time, in the freshness, the joy, and the healing of the garden. So some of the aspects that we could consider, in fact, when we want to work like a gardener in the field of fostering intercultural dialogue are many of the things that artists consider when we're working in creating our practices in creating artworks in improvising especially because improvisational artists really, really, really have to tune into the quality of dialogue that can have both listening and expressing. So I'm just going to give you some ideas. And I'm glad that people have it down in writing because later you can look back at it sometime and think about it. Think about what aspects related to a place would help foster the dialogue. And when I say dialogue, I also mean dialogue with oneself, not just with one or more people, but a sense of communication. So in the sense of place, for example, is there a place that is culturally significant or heritage site where the genius loci evokes an atmosphere of dialogue or a remembrance of social cultural values? Would a natural environment be more suitable for dialogue or a semi-open air or a closed architectural setting that has elements of nature within it. 
such as plants, flowers, stones, moving or still water, sunlight or flower, firelight, currents of fresh air, and open space, unfettered space. And also what type of spatial layout? Spatial, what I mean is the space itself would be most conducive for dialogue. For instance, a rectangular or a square, Zoom is a rectangular space actually, with participants on all four sides to stimulate discussion. Or an oval arrangement to stimulate creativity or a circular space to stimulate a sense of spiritual atmosphere. We can also consider about the time. Actually, I sent out the different time zones to people about the Zoom and then I was thinking about, oh, for my friends on the West Coast in California, it's 11 p.m. the night before. <laughs> or here in Badulu Village, uh, it's not just the 13th, Wednesday the 13th of April, it's also a few days before the, the peak of the anniversary of the Samuan Chiga Temple. So the notion of time itself also is quite varied. But when we think about time, if we're interested in fostering a space of intercultural dialogue, we can think about what is the nuance of the era and also what possible influence that might have on the dialogue. Is there a favorable day? Actually, some calendar systems are very, very clear about what days are favorable for dialogue and what days are absolutely not. <laughs> or is there a date? that marks an annual event of importance. Would it be beneficial to engage in the dialogue at dawn or in the morning or at noon or in the afternoon or at dusk or in the evening or in the stillness of the middle of the night. Would sharing and dialoguing multiple places in the same time or circulating to several different sites over a period of time be a benefit? And what rhythms of the movement, music or words would support the dialogue? And when are the moments of silence for contemplation or receiving the speaking of people's inner feelings? And then also, of course, the conditions. What proximity to or distance from a place of cultural significance? And what physical distance between the people involved will foster dialogue? Would dialogue in small groups followed by a gathering of all together be a benefit? Would it be suitable to use higher level middle level and lower level areas in the space? What orientation is conducive for a dialogue rather than a grid structure where participants are in a passive position facing speakers positioned 
in the front. And we'll sitting on the ground or on chairs or will standing or will moving be more conducive for dialogue. And what is the resonance of the environment? <laughs> and how are the people tuning with each other and the situation? So just to conclude this brief talk, I'd like to just reiterate that with the increasing contact between people of diverse cultures in all regions of the world, the ability to engage in dialogue has become ever more vital. In fact, UNESCO has also hosted numerous conferences since its inception in 1946 that have led to guiding documents such as the Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity, 2001, and the Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions, 2005 in which the Article 4 presents that. Interculturality refers to the existence and equitable interaction of diverse cultures and the possibility of generating shared cultural expressions through dialogue and mutual respect. I believe that on a concrete level, the creative process of art can contribute much to the fostering of a common field and that taking into account the place, the time and the conditions offers valuable guidance Even though the list that I offered today is not at all inclusive, there are many different aspects that you yourself can add and hopefully will. In fact, yesterday I did, I thought, how many people, <laughs> which I never thought about before. But I think that I hope that it serves as a source of inspiration, even just the title of the talk. For artists, for teachers, staff and students, curriculum developers and community members who wish to develop a practice-based approach to the art of intercultural dialogue. I hope that we can, let us try. And we can start today via Zoom, <laughs> Wednesday Forum. So I should mention that the video that I showed today I chose it because it was imperfect. It was bumpy. The camera was going like this. You couldn't hear the incredible voices of Penny Chandra and Meredith Monk so well. You could hear the chicken. You could hear the birds. You could hear a child maybe complaining to his mom. Actually, I know that child wondering if he could join the movement with me. <laughs> or the fabric got kind of caught 
while I was moving. And then I realized, ah, I have to, I have to receive this reality and work with it. And then it became something beautiful, actually, the reality. So one of the things that I feel as a dancer, especially, is that we actually train to have sensitivity about place time conditions constantly every time that we practice dance. If it's a really good teacher, any dance form, a, a master teacher will stimulate awareness of place, time, and conditions. We learn how to measure. We learn how to adapt to changing conditions, including the changing conditions of our own body. And we learn how to have awareness of ourself and others at the same time, a simultaneous kinesthetic. I'm going to say that word again, <laughs> kinesthetic. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a knowing that comes through the moving itself. And it's actually a knowing that comes through the body, through the tissues of the body moving, not just through the mind or sentences, <laughs> words like this. but it's the speaking of the body itself. So I want to open the forum for questions and I wanna ask people to also please try to give space for the more quiet people. So if you're somebody who usually likes to speak and turn on the microphone very quickly, that we would try to just take a pause for a moment, a small moment, and give space and time for a more quiet person to take their step forward. Or if you're a more nonverbal person and you have a question, but you are shy to ask it with sound, you can type it in the chat box and we will ask our dear friend whose name is Abdi, which is very fitting because it's offering service <laughs> to read the question. And I really would like to encourage you to please ask any question that comes into your mind because Usually in the question answer is, I find, is where some of the most rich material happens in these kinds of forums. And I offer myself to share as best I can. And I'm also allowed to ask questions. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Let's move on. Okay. Let's start with Q&A. Okay, thank you very much, Mbak Dayan. Yeah, uh, I will open the, uh, the question for the floor. And yeah, <laughs> it's a good presentation. So yeah. Uh, okay, everyone, uh, you could uh, raise your hand. If you want to ask question, you could raise your virtual hand. Mm -hmm. And you could also write in the chat box. And I will read it for you as uh, my name is Abdi. It means a server. And if you follow this question on YouTube, you could also write it in the chat box. So please. I'll see you around. <laughs> Maybe here's. I think we have one. I have a question. Ida sure, Fitri? Sure. Ida Fitri? <laughs> Ibu Ida Fitri? Yes, Ibu. 
around how many people are joined on the Zoom now? A Zoom 17 right now. And do you have an idea of where they're from? Mm. More or less? <laughs> yeah, the... uh, most of them from Yogyakarta. But uh, I see here from Makassar and then um, maybe Surabaya. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. Okay. Only that, only that I know. Okay. And then on the YouTube, you have an idea of how many? Um, I have to check. Seventeen. Okay. Seventeen. Oh, thank you. Seventeen. Abby. Okay. So we could be around twenty-three people together on this. That's nice. May I ask another funny question, Ida Fitri? Yes, it will. <laughs> Um, majority Indonesian? Yes. Okay. I'm not going to ask about gender because that's too complicated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we better not question, but we it, don't need to get into that. Yes. Yeah. But but people who have that, you know, passport or the Kartu identitas Indonesia mayoritas. <laughs> okay. Okay. And then may I ask you another question, Ida Fitri? Is it okay? Sure. Are you sitting in an office? Yes. In an office. Okay. Are there windows? Yes, in my left. And they open? No. Or they, they're sealed? Yeah. Okay. It's part of the reality of modernity. Do you know where I'm sitting by seeing? This yeah. is not an exam, a kind of? <laughs> uh, like in terrace? Yeah. Of your home? Yeah, it's like a ballet, a okay. pavilion, open, open air pavilion. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So it's open and near the garden, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to turn the camera a little bit. Is it okay? Mm -hmm. But okay. I have to unplug. This is this is always an interesting. This is like being a waitress. I'm going to pick up the laptop slowly, like a waitress, like this. And I'm just going to try to uh, be a camera person. Uh, here we go. Okay. So it's an open air pavilion like this, and actually this is a more of a social one mm -hmm. because it's long. It's called a long, long ballet. I think you have it in Java also because I live in the home of the former chief of the village of Bedulu. Oh, nice. So the, they, their long ballet like this. How, how is my tour doing? Should I back up more? Get my head out of there. Can you see how long it is? Uh, more or less? It's a light ebook. Yeah. Oh, too white because of the sun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> same okay. here. But now, hold on. You can feel the sense of the length a little bit. Mm, yes. A little bit. I can okay. see it. So it's long. Mm -hmm. And it, that means it's, a, it's an area where it's good for making the offerings, for gathering in the social sense or for studying also, it's a space that people would would sit and study. Mm -hmm. Often sitting, pardon me, it fell. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh no, oh no. Hold on, I'm gonna come and open this now for you, but you can sit on it. So for Indonesians, you know, this is a common kind of thing to see the idea that it's not always about the chair. It's, sometimes it's really like on the mat. Yeah. You know, or this kind of Western chair is something that came later. Mm -hmm. Probably, well, we're not gonna get into a big post-colonial problem. <laughs> but, but you understand that, you understand this in, in Java also and in all over Nusantara that there are these this idea of the long space. It's a long rectangle. It's not really a square. 
for social and also it's where people would meet if they need to talk about something important they would sit in this kind of area sometimes <laughs> now you like this right sometimes i actually i would look at the spatial layout of the united nations and i thought to myself something is a little bit off they're not going to be able to ever come to a uh, fruitful conclusions because of the spatial layout. It's it's good in some ways because it has semicircle in the front, but it's bad because it has this feeling of the us and the them. <laughs> okay, one last question, Ida Fitri, sorry. You teach ever? Sometimes, yeah. No, no. Mostly more structural administ administration. Yes. Okay. Yes. When you have a meeting with your colleagues, yeah. What kind of configuration do you sit in usually? Pardon me. What kind of configuration do you sit in? How do you sit? How do you place the chairs? Or is it more like? <laughs> There's some who sit on the ground. There's some who sit in chairs. There's some who like sit outside and they're like, I'll just call you. <laughs> no, is it more random or does it have a kind of, uh, depending on how formal it is, is that right? Yeah, it depends okay. on that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Abdi, are we ready for some questions from other people? I unmute myself. Okay. okay. Oh, we have a comment from Ifa Tarle. Thank you for a very insightful talk. What stood out for me is how by engaging into cross-cultural practices, we create together a common culture, such, uh, such a beautiful vision. <laughs> Eva actually worked in uh, the diplomatic sphere mm. and then started dancing. She got out of the office and just started dancing. <laughs> Literally, she quit her position in the diplomatic corps because, yeah, yeah. you know, it, it happens sometimes that you might feel some people are can work within the uh, systems and some people need to work outside of the systems. Yeah. Actually, I am. I'm blessed that in this life, I don't have a lot of uh, bitterness about the system. So I can, I can go to the very, very formal system. I can sit at the World Culture Forum. I can sit, you know, and I can go to the United Nations, which, which we did, or I can sit it with the village. Either way, I'm fine. I don't really make a big deal. But I, I can feel for people when they feel a kind of frustration between the gap of the urban world and the mm. gap of the rural world. I can really feel the, the suffering in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay. Next. Next. Oh. Uh, okay. Because uh, maybe some people have to, uh, shy to ask. I, I want to ask okay. questions actually, but yeah. And it's also fine to ask in Bahasa Indonesia, and then I will First. translate it to English, or you translate it. No problem. Yeah. Please feel Perfect. free. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, I want to ask like. Uh, oh, when the dialogue is failed. <laughs> yeah yeah what happened what how we deal with that i mean like sometimes <laughs> it's yeah sometimes when we do some inter intercultural dialogue or cross-cultural dialogue it's sometimes it's not working well and then something yeah and i forgot that <laughs> yeah what happened if the dialogue is off something like that and 
What will you? Uh, what what we do? What do we do? I like that. Okay. What so it depends. Do? I'm laughing because I'm thinking about how many times I failed. Okay. So actually, in my experience. I would go back to a very simple thing as a movement person. You know, there's always little, little failures every day in my movement practice. And then I'm, I am working with a process of tuning. Sure. Tuning. It's not always manilaraskan. It's not always harmonizing. That's different. Harmonizers are people who would like to make everything good. I'm not like that because I, I understand that there is suffering and I receive the fact that there is suffering, but there's tuning. So tuning would be my, the face mask. This is actually a measurement tuning. Uh, I like this, this, this one because it, it's, it has a little bit of uh, flexibility to it. And the shape is more flattering to me than some of the other ones, but I have to shorten it because the, the, my face from here to here is not as big as this. So that's my tuning. My tuning is making very small shortenings on the sides like that. I'll give you another example. I'd like to do it spatially. Is that okay? Okay, sure. Okay. So this setup of the chair and the table, you can see that one like that. Yeah. Right? There's one chair is, is facing the open air. Mm. So that person sitting there gets to see the beautiful garden. Mm. And I would think about this. I wouldn't think about it. I would feel it when I'm preparing to have a discussion. Huh? If I if I had to sit in a chair. So this person is sitting in this chair and they get to see a beautiful garden. You can see the beautiful garden. Sure, yeah. Yes. Okay. The person who's sitting in this chair is seeing the interior space, which is okay. But imagine if there were four or five family members over there waiting for the decision. <laughs> that might not be the nicest place to sit because you would feel like all eyes were on you. Yeah. Whereas the one sitting in this chair would have the joy of just being out in the open, fresh space like that. Mm. One thing I noticed actually a lot in the, when I first started working with more traditional cultures, and it wasn't just with Indonesians, you know, sometimes also in Mexico, I experienced this. Uh, was that, or in Japan really, because it's so formal. Uh, I mean, the formality is so visceral. Position where, where someone sits, like uh, the position of the elder in the space, the position of the younger person in the space. Whereas in, for example, in America, which most people on this YouTube know, I'm American. Uh, you know, especially starting with the 60s, the idea of this hierarchy of elder or hierarchy of professor or hierarchy of leader was constantly being pulled into a, into a horizontal framing and spatially speaking also. Like I often met with my students sitting, yeah, of course on the ground because I'm a dancer, but also when I went to Juilliard, which is classical, formal, modern dance, the master teacher was in the front and the dancers were all practicing. So there was a split like that. But when I started to work more improvisationally, I'm a part of the process. So I'm, I'm with the people who are studying. 
I don't even call them students anymore. I am studying while I'm also guiding. I am practicing while I'm also trying to dialogue. Mm. It was a long answer. <laughs> but coming back to tuning, which aspect, if you tune it a little bit and you just try, that's the only way. You can try and fail. You can try and have success. You can try one thing, it works one time, another time it never, it doesn't work like that again. Mm. And some things just happen by the blessing of life. <laughs> like the time, the place and the conditions just, and it's just a mm. blessing of life and you just say, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, but I yeah. would add one thing, Abdi, which is uh, less control, which is not easy for human beings. Less idea of control, but also not passive. Next. <laughs> In alignment. Okay. Potra, ah, my friend Potra, who is a specialist in interfaith education in the Philippines, just came in. Somebody else, please. Please don't be shy, or else I'm going to have to call on you, and then you're going to be upset. <laughs> I'll just make a comment. Um, Please say your name. Sorry. All right, Mike. Mike, I forgot you can't see us. Yeah. Um, uh, Mike Quinlan from the U.S., but I, I work with ICRS. But I'm also Pandeta, um, and so uh, of course for worship, you. You know, we're very we're very mindful of space and uh, how the space is set, um, so that people can uh, not be distracted by outer things, but. Yeah, I mean, I really like this. Uh, I really like what you've written here. Um, it'd be really good if you uh, created almost like a, some sort of framework where you could plan a meeting based on uh, your questions. Um, because yeah, I mean, I, we have meetings, of course, at the office, and we have meetings with dialogues and things like that. And just to be to help be reminded of these things, to walk through these things. I'm looking at one of our other staff members who's uh, having to attend a meeting overseas uh, and he, he is fasting. Um, and uh -huh. this is a, in, an interfaith group um, dealing with ethics and yet they've held this uh, meeting over Labaran. And so I, <laughs> you know, just <laughs> the questions that you have are, help us to be very mindful um, and just stop and think about, um, yeah, just being intentional with the space. Uh -huh. And the timing and things like that so it i just has to do with awareness yeah yeah so i just want to say i appreciate it thank you thank you too is it okay i ask you a question mike yeah sure sure <laughs> you know ever since i was a young person i always had lots of questions i think that's why i got into education <laughs> yeah because it means that every day i can work in the field of asking questions but i also yeah. like to try to to work with solutions. So I have a question about this, the, the thing that I heard, which kind of quickly passed uh, in your phrase when you said about the place of maybe prayer or the place for religious practice yeah. to not be distracted. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm Buddhist. And I, I can appreciate the idea of, uh, for example, being in a s places where I, when I went on retreat, the notion was, especially solo retreat, the notion was no distraction. I am mm. not allowed to speak with people. I shouldn't meet with people. I actually, the food is delivered to a little drop off point uh, a few times a week. So for maybe six weeks, I didn't actually have real, real, you could say real, contact with a, another human being 
and that was part of the, the guideline of the retreat of solo retreat practice in Buddhism. Yeah, I had an interesting experience, Mike. I was constantly distracted. Mm. <laughs> And I was constantly distracted by all the people. Who came into my memory. And then I realized I, there was no way to practice unless I just invited them in. Invited them in to the space of the meditation. As long as I kept thinking I should be alone. Yeah. The more alone I was, the more, I can't even say it in English. I was going to say the more rame, the more crowded it got. I was shocked. No one told me that that was their experience in solo retreat, that it was actually a huge crowd of people. People I hadn't met in 10 years came and told me something. <laughs> okay, so there's that one. And the second is, um, you know, the positive thing of open air environments, uh, especially, for example, in the New Centaur region, is there's a porousness between what you could call the public space and the private space. And in my, in my experience, that gives a sense of safety. So, for example, Bali Hinduism, when they pray, it's an outdoor open air temple. There's walls, but the wall actually architecturally here is built in a measurement that people should still be able to see if there's someone outside of the parameter. Sometimes it's little holes, like at the stupa of Borbador, it's not a, a hole uh, up in the mind is solid, mm -hmm. but it actually has, it has little windows so that the Buddha sitting inside can see through the small lattice. That receiving the outside world sometimes can be very irritating for people and I really appreciate that. But one of the positive things I have learned here is is yes, is letting the outside in a little bit, open the windows a little bit. I think that also gives safety to religions when other people can see what we're doing. Except, of course, there are some things that are, are really the most interior and the most private. And yes, those should be in places where it's unseen, where you close the cloth, you close the cabin door. So I'm gonna add that to the list mm. of, and thank you for mentioning that, about how porous is the environment? How much can the dialoguers be seen by others or heard by others? And when should it just be in, a, in its own really, really private interior space like that? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very, very much, Mike, for the comment. And everyone, any question? If you don't have any question, but Dian will ask you a question. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, Ripka? Ripka. Ripka. Lovely to hear Lovely you. Lovely of you. Hello, Ripka. Hello, Budayan. Hello, Ripka. Thank you for sharing uh, with us today. Well, I have a question for a, from a friend. Uh, the question is in Bahasa, actually. Bahasa Indonesia. Okay. Okay. Bagaimana pengalaman, pertanyaannya, bagaimana pengalaman sebagai penari uh, mempengaruhi gaya dialog uh, cross cultural Mbak uh, di, Mbak Dayan. <laughs> okay, and then Ripka, you want me to say the question in English or you say it in English? Um, 
Well, okay. I'm not sure whether this one is correct in English, but the question is okay. uh, how your experience as a dancer um, influence um, your style, your mm-hmm. yeah, your style in cross-cultural uh, <laughs> dialogue. Okay, that's good. All right, so it's one of my favorite questions. <laughs> my background is very classical, uh, but I wasn't a very good classical dancer for a few reasons. Uh, first, when I I studied more, it was called Dalcro's Rhythmics, which is improvisational, building sensitivity to music. So the, the teacher would just da 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 and we would move, move however we liked to move. We were children, I was five, skipping, falling, rolling, listening, la, breathing, and going forward again <laughs> like that. It had quality of musicality and movement. It actually comes from a, a French uh, school of thought, but it's connected with the ORF, Germanic also. When I started to study ballet, what I loved was the, the decorum and the, uh, you could say the skillfulness of it. But what I didn't like was I went to audition for the Midsummer's Night's Dream their children who should play fairies. And I forgot my slippers, the little shoes. So they wouldn't let me do the audition. And I turned to my mom and I said, well, then I need to find a dance where I can dance without slippers. So I was already as a little girl had this kind of Let's find the solution. It's interesting because many dances here are done without slippers. <laughs> so I felt a friendliness with Asia almost immediately the first time I came to Japan. People took off their shoes and I felt relief. It sounds kind of simple, but it, it was a big deal for me. And also people sat more down like on a stool or the feet on the floor, not on the chair, and I felt more comfortable. I actually found myself in the West often sitting on a chair with my legs uh, lifted up on the chair because I felt more comfortable than my feet hanging down and not touching the earth. So these are physical sensations. But then I had to learn how to have what was my dance in the repertory. And you can make an analogy with religion or with cultural norms. So if my movement wasn't exactly like the ideal classical ballet or my movement wasn't exactly like Martha Graham, even though I studied Martha Graham technique, what should I do? because I still needed to move. Movement was still the main language. So slowly I started to explore more what was my language in moving, but of course my language has a dialect. Upamanya saya bitra bahasa Indonesia ada dialect, ada dialect Bahasa Orang America, yang berbicara bahasa Indonesia, mungkin agak lebih kurang karena saya lama di Indonesia. So when I speak Indonesian, my Indonesian has an American accent, but not so bad because I've lived here for a while. And I hear it all the time. It's always coming into my sense perceptions. But I don't ever have a, an idea that I should be the perfect speaker of Bahasa Indonesia. 
because I accept that I have American English is my first language. So that will be in my tongue and in my all my muscles in here and in the ways that I hear things, in the ways that I see things, in the way that my skin perceives things. But <laughs> when I move with somebody or I speak with somebody who is speaking another language, their language, how can I find something that can have a resonance not too big, not too small, but honest. So for example, Indonesian dance in general has a sense of starting from, starting from, from, from stillness and then has movement from still, stillness and then has, has movement, something like that. It has core and, and creates space, like more like an umbrella. Western dance is about space. So I was taught, you know, one, open, 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 shift, shift, move, move, <laughs> like that. And also move through the space, <laughs> move through the space <laughs> like that. <laughs> so what happens when, how can I do this and not knock over that? If I need to do it big, then I should do it over there. So I do this movie here, and this one is in her beautiful stillness here, and I'm in my movement. But it's okay, I can have this, and he or she or they can have that. And then who knows, maybe sometime they need to move over to there, and then okay, I'm gonna go back to here like that. I let them have presence. And then I need to move again because it's honest. I'm not going to hold myself. That would be lying. Okay. <laughs> it's still okay. It's still okay. I need to lay down. They would never lay down. It's okay. And then maybe slowly, slowly, we can find the breathing together <laughs> between the two worlds. Who knows? like a good jazz has like that. Kind of like that. So how to let the other have presence. I also have presence. And then slowly, slowly find where there's a tuning. But the beauty of the dancer is more than even the musician is that we can move sense the movement of other, hear, make sound at the same time. So we have more than just the jazz musician is like going like that. Like that. They're just doing listening and sounding, which is extraordinary, or drummers also. But dancers, we have to do it spatially, not spatially. <laughs> Spatially. <laughs> That's why I think about the United Nations. I think about how the United Nations could be shifted a little bit so that the spatiality of it would help for coming to a common field of decision or solutions. Not the group, we're all sitting here, they come in, they sit there, They try to make a decision. And then they leave. <laughs> and these people are 
<laughs> what happened? <laughs> Can you get a book too? Maybe they should just open up the, the roof a little bit or make an alun alun, which is a little healthier because it's not a straight shot, which is a little aggressive. Okay, let's add a little bit more. It's 327, 227, sorry, wrong time zone. One more, please. Okay, 227, one more, please. Uh, Pak Diki, one have a comment? <laughs> No, no, okay. no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not much of a dancer, you see. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're probably more than you realize. Particularly. Yeah, we will we'll never know. When, but, yeah. The, Akbar, okay. have a comment? Or I could tell the story of Dewi Ruchi, why yeah. I called the piece yeah. Dewi Ruchi Dewi, Not Dewa Ruchi. Yeah, I also no, not want to ask that. Yeah, I want to ask okay. that actually. Why Dewi Ruchi? Okay, okay. So for most, you know, Indonesians will know that uh, Dewi Ruchi is actually the great story of dialogue. <laughs> it's the search for the truth. And, you know, it's wandering all over the place and it's, you know, running into many different obstacles and having many hopes and fears. <laughs> But it's a lackey. It's a male figure. So a number of years ago, our dear friend Pap Prapto said, It's good, Diane, you do Dewi Ruchi. <laughs> what is the process of the female in the search for enlightenment, which will have a different flavor? Or maybe, you know, people will say nowadays, what is the the Dewa Dewa Ruchi for people who have more than one gender identification. Um, so I worked with it because I, I trusted Prapto, especially in that sense of the seed in the garden and how it could blossom. And then one day when I was going to work with Ibu Rusini, who is a classical dancer from the Kraton in Solo. I said, I don't know what to do. And he said, oh, you can just sweep. Just bring broom because I need function when I'm moving. So then it transitioned into Dewi Ruchi Nyapu. So she is in a process. I, Diane Butler, am in a process of trying to purify my inner lens and my outer lens so that I can receive all the different colors of reality, all the different conditions, all the different positions and feel the sense of the unity and diversity. There's not separate between the micro and the macro. It all is changing like that. And then I just went on and I swept at Borobudur. I swept at the cave of Goa Selomangleng of Kilisuchi. I swept at Chandi Awan, Sumur Awan. I swept at Pejang near Mandala, near the Pura Samuntika, which is the great interfaith temple of Bali, where nine faith groups met in the 11th century and creatively <laughs> created co-conciliatory <laughs> practices. I swept in Tejapula where different cultures met. I swept in America, I swept in Italy and at CC. <laughs> and I think I'm just gonna keep sweeping because it feels like a really good practice to do. And I'm lucky because Several Indonesians who don't know me, or yeah, you could say traditional rural people, when they saw me sweeping, sweeping, they smiled like I had found a common language that I could sweep. <laughs> okay. 
Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate being able to share with you all today. And if we can do that hello one more time, I think it's a great way to finish before Abdi gives closing remarks. <laughs> sure. Hello. So hello everyone. And I want all of you to uh, open your mic, open your camera and let's say hello one by one. Hello. <laughs> hello. 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 Thank you, Budayan. Thank you. Belum <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yeah, it's like a bit of sound like hello, 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 goodbye, hello, 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 hello goodbye, and something like that. And okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for more than one and a half hours. Thank you. A deep, a deep and inspiring discussions. And yeah, when I saw that, actually, when I saw the title, uh, this kind of title discussion, like platform, the place, time, and conditions in the art of intercultural dialogue, and <laughs> I need to make a poster. One thing that in my mind that comes in my mind is, oh, maybe this is the what tone of intercultural dialogue when you say place, time, and conditions, something like that. And then, yeah. And after from the presentation, I learned that we adapt not only through our mind, through our words, but also our sense, our body, that sometimes we forget that. And if some things that happen, if we fail the dialogue or we fail in many things and there's still sufferings, as you say, Mr. Anne, God bless. It's the bless of the living. Still, it's a blessing. And then uh, I will not conclude anymore and because each one of us have their own reflection has their own way to tuning, to tune. And so let the thousands flowers bloom. And thank you very much, Mbak Dian, for this beautiful presentations. And everyone, don't forget, okay. next week, next week, next week, in the same hour, we will have Dr. Aan Suryana from Institute of South East Asian Studies, who will present his research entitled Religious Radicalism in Major Campuses in Indonesia. So see you in next Wednesday. Stay healthy and stay happy. Assalamualaikum, Om Fasciastu, Rahayu, Rahayu, Rahayu. Thank you very much. Terima kasih, Matruan, Abianto. Merci, Dakushun. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Terima kasih, Budayan Abdi. Thanks, everyone. Okay, I will close the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Budayan. Thank you, Fuka. Sehat, sehat. Sehat, sehat, sehat. <laughs>